welcome. Thanks for sticking around for the last talk of the weekend. Um, I appreciate I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody's tired. Uh, and I hope that I can end this uh, event on an interesting note. Um, this is not a particularly technical talk, uh, although there are some technical bits in it. Um, but I, hopefully it's just sort of interesting. It gives you something to chew on on the way home. Uh, so I'm Ben Brown. Um, that's me riding my two dogs through the desert, as we are wont to do. Um, I've been making websites for a really long time. Uh, I started in the mid-90s uh, when I was uh, early in college. Uh, when I got my first static IP in 1996, I set up a web server and started doing it. Um, this is my um, Wayback Machine uh, personal website chart, so you can see it stretches all the way back to 1998. A little scary. Um, this is what my website looked like 15 years ago, my personal website, back when we uh, put content just right on the front page. Uh, that was just a wild idea. Um, here's what it looked like in 2000. Uh, by then I had moved on to just linking to the content from the front page. <clears throat> Notably, 2000 was the year that uh, I came to South by Southwest uh, here for the first time. Don't Please don't read the content on my website from 13 years ago. This always happens. I'm like, oh, no, this embarrassing stuff that's on there. But anyways, speaking of embarrassing, like I went to a talk just around the corner. South by Southwest 2000 was in this little section right here only. And I went to a talk right there about uh, how blogs were the new big thing. Uh, <laughs> no. <clears throat> and I actually cried. I like shed real man tears about how like blogs were going to kill the internet. Ugh, how wrong I was. Anyways, 2003, uh, 2005, you know, we can recognize the, the uh, sort of evolution of, of web design here uh, from content to more shorter and shorter little bits and bits of links. Here it was in 2006 when I switched to Tumblr. Uh, so, you know, I show this stuff to you guys to not only establish the fact that I've been doing this for a long time, but really to show like how little web design has changed uh, over 15, 16, 17 years. Um, you know, we have titles, body text, uh, maybe an image or, or a link or two, but for the most part, it's been very static. Uh, so I work at XOXCO right now. It's the company my wife and I founded, um, and we work on cool stuff. Basically, we just try to stay at the uh, front edge of what, what's happening in technology and um, work there um, and sort of do prototypes and uh, research and development projects for um, ourselves and for our clients. Um, most recently is a tool that we've built called Packager, uh, which is a tool that allows you to take content that you've published on your normal website, uh, import it and uh, curate it and cre publish it back out as various digital, uh, premium digital formats like ebooks or iOS apps. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, so how many of you work on content websites? I assume like most, most everybody. Yeah. So I'm not... Uh, there's some things in, in this talk where I'm talking about how like people who run content websites don't know what they're doing. Like I'm not yelling at you. Um, I don't mean to uh, to uh, you know to be mean or anything like that. But um, I, I'm really passionate about this stuff, and I feel like we don't do as good a job as we could. Um, and uh, so take it with a grain of salt when uh, when uh, I start getting all red in the face. So this talk is basically two talks jammed into one. Uh, this is the beginning of the first one. So reader-aware design. Um, this is a t uh, uh, term that we came up with to describe some of the work that we did um, uh, over the last year. Um, you might also hear people talking about context-aware design. This is basically the same concept, but uh, reader-aware design has a cooler uh, hashtag. So um, we collect a lot of information about the readers of our websites. Um, you know, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, there is a screenshot of Google Analytics that pretty much probably everybody has seen or looks at it every day. And uh, you know, we, how many people visited our, our website? How many of those were unique visits? Um, what's the percentage of new visits that, uh, uh, in, in that traffic? And this is the kind of stuff that we use to make decisions about whether our website is successful or um, do we need new software? Do we need to change the design? Um, how much can we charge for our, for our advertisers? Um, but 
but most of us probably don't go much further than uh, you know, that front page of Google Analytics that tells us how many people hit our site um, or maybe what the popular content is. So for the most part, what we're doing is giving Google a, a really nice present, um, an enormous database of, of data about our users and our readers that they use to sell ads on, on our website. Um, so that's good for everybody in, in a sense, but um, I, I, I suspect that Google's getting a lot more value out of that than the average person making you know, a couple bucks a month on their on their Google ads. <clears throat> and, I, and I would posit that most uh, medium to small digital publishers don't even realize that their, their data is going into this giant aggregated pool that's being used to sell ads on other people's websites. Uh, so um, reader, uh, so what we don't do with that data is, is use it in service of the actual readers of our website. Um, so reader aware design is, a, is the idea of, of sort of taking some of that beta data back and putting it to use um, for our readers. Now we've got responsive design and everybody loves responsive design and um, one of the exciting things that for me that uh, responsive design did was that it taught us that the proper way of building websites is, is no longer to build you know one monolithic uh, you know desktop website um, but to actually build things as a, a series of components or um, little widgets that can interact with one another and can reflow into you know whatever screen size or context that uh, the user finds themselves in I think that's a really valuable thing to have broken down our, our designs into these atomic components um, you know, we used to all read websites like this, you know, hunched over our, our computers. And it was 100% of people who were looking at your website were sitting at a desktop computer. They were probably at work. Um, and you knew, you know, what kind of person that was because of that. Um, but now people are reading uh, web content on, on a variety of devices uh, and, and different contexts. And in addition to the screen size uh, differences that we have, these devices allowed people to consume that content in different ways. Um, so it's not just about, um, you know, uh, small screen versus large screen. Now we have people who read, um, you know, read at, the, at home on the couch after they get home from work. And they read in a totally different way than they would if they were sitting at their desk at work. Um, you know, people read on the plane or, or on a commute. Uh, maybe it's on an, maybe they're not even on the, on the internet, but are reading on an e-reader um, and reading cached or archived material. So this is a substantially different way of using content than um, sitting at a desk and, and, and reloading a blog or a, a new site a couple times a day to see what's new. <clears throat> um, so screen size is just one type of context clue. And uh, you know, so like I said, reader aware design is the idea of taking that data from analytics and um, combining it with some of the techniques that we've developed for responsive design. Uh, that is uh, reflowing the content or using style sheets to um, adjust the way the website looks based on these context clues um, to enhance the experience of accessing and um, going through this content that we're providing for, for our readers. So this used to be really hard. Um, you know, you guys probably know being Drupal people, um, you know, if you want to do customizations to the content or layout of your site, most of the time that means that you have to do it on the back end. Right, so your PHP scripts are going to render different markup and serve it to the user, uh, and that means that the database is going to get hit, your processor is going to get hit, and it's difficult to cache that material because you're doing it for every single different user, maybe in a slightly different way. <clears throat> but it's thankfully getting a lot easier now. Um, we can do a lot of this stuff uh, on the front end now. Um, we can reflow content. We can, um, you know, insert and prune elements out of the DOM. Um, and we can store information and um, build up this sort of analytical profile of, of readers uh, in their browser and without having to synchronize it to the server. Now, there's limitations to that for sure. Uh, for example, it doesn't cross devices. So um, information you gather about a user uh, on one device and store in local storage doesn't, doesn't translate to their uh, other devices. Um, and that's, you know, definitely a flaw in, in, the, in the stuff that I'm going to talk about. However, I suspect that uh, based on the pace of browser uh, manufacturer progress and, and the way they're releasing updates to their mobile browsers, that very soon that those cookies and local storage and whatnot that's stored uh, in these little silos will, will very soon be synchronized uh, in the browser level uh, itself. So Chrome is Chrome no matter where you go. So I think that's, this problem is going to be short-lived. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to talk talk about some tools to and some techniques uh, that we've developed to do this reader-aware design stuff. I think it's pretty cool. Um, 
So the first one is one that we developed. It's called aware.js. <clears throat> the examples I'm going to show are using aware.js. Um, and you can get that. It's free MIT open source license at our website, XOX. Well, you can see the URL right there. Um, there's another one that I'd like to mention. Uh, my friends at the Wall Street Journal built this. It's called Intention.js. This is sort of a super powered version of Aware um, that not only um, that allows you to set up different contexts that your uh, your site can respond to. So um, they can do essentially any arbitrary piece of information. You can um, um, make these sort of logic decisions. Um, it's very very cool. Great for very large news sites. It was built for use on the Wall Street Journal website. Okay, so aware.js uh, starts like this. Uh, it's a jQuery plugin, so all you have to do to call it up is, is, is this little line of code. And right away, what that's going to do is add a bunch of uh, CSS classes to your, to your uh, body element. <clears throat> so they, it adds things like this, first visit, repeat visitor, first visit of the day. Um, so this is the same kind of thing that you uh, would see in your analytics, but um, made available to you as a CSS style sheet or al also as a JavaScript variable. So um, again, using those same techniques that we have with responsive design, if you treat these things like a media query, you can do all sorts of things uh, to change the content uh, and, and uh, layout of your website. Uh, so here's some examples. The first one um, is not even using any uh, JavaScript. It is the visited pseudo class. Um, I think that the visited pseudo class is like one of the coolest things that we have uh, that is very rarely used. Um, so most of the time you see it being used like this, right? If, if, if at all. Um, I, like I, the worst thing I see is when people just set the color to the same, at, same color as the new link. Uh, it's like there's information for your reader here. Um, so yeah, so you can change the color of the, of the link text when somebody has clicked that link previously. Um, you can also change the background color of a link. So you can like highlight new links, but not highlight old links, even if they're the same color. Um, so they pop out, right? Easy. Um, so you can also change the background uh, or the border color. Uh, so you can do things like this, like one's a kind of a button, one of them is not as much of a button. Uh, I'm not like a CSS, like a awesome genius. So sorry for the plainness of these examples. Um, but here's the cool thing. So a, a, a couple of years ago, you were actually able to do anything with the visited tag. Um, you could like completely restyle the, the elements and like hide it or show it or do all sorts of crazy stuff. But that basically turned out to be a security, uh, security problem because malicious people could use that uh, to um, determine where you had been before. Um, so they were able to basically crawl your, your browser history using this visited tag. Um, so you can't, you can't read any of the um, visited tag attributes in JavaScript or anything like that. They're, it's invisible to you um, and only shows to the user. And you can only change the color, background color, and border color attributes, but you can change it on the uh, A tag, the before and after pseudo elements, and any child tag inside that A tag which is awesome because in HTML5, a, a tags can, can, can contain child tags. Um, so you could do stuff like this. Um, here I'm changing the color of the um, description inside that A tag as well. So it's just dimming out after uh, this thing has been visited. <clears throat> and here's an example where I've used pseudo elements. So, so a new link has a left facing arrow and our old link has a right facing arrow. Again, like not the most practical example here, but um, you can imagine one of those like CSS guru guys like doing some really crazy stuff. You can put like 10 subordinate elements in here and each one can have before and after elements. You can put a, a arbitrary uh, you know, material inside that link and use all sorts of CSS tricks to do this. You know, 50 different borders or whatever. So that's really cool, uh, visited tags. So uh, here's an example of how we use that in one of our projects. We redesigned Pando Daily, which is a tech blog you guys might have heard of. And at the bottom of every page on Pando Daily, there's a re what we call the weekly recap. It just links to every single article that they've published that week uh, in, a, in, in like piled up by day. Um, and the links that you've read are gray versus the links you haven't read are blue. So this gives you a really easy visual sort of calendar-like way of seeing what you've read, what you haven't read, how up to date you are on the things that Pando Daily has published. Um, really, really simple, no code, no JavaScript required for that. So new versus returning users is uh, something that we really care about a lot, especially if we have community features on our site. Um, but um, 
it's uh, you know one of the one of the number one stats that, that people pay attention to. Um, so aware uh, handles this. Uh, it adds a first visit um, class to the body if the user has never visited the site before, and you can do all sorts of stuff with that. But uh, at the very least, you could display a welcome message uh, to to those new users. So what, 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 what kind of welcome message or what kind of information would you want to present to somebody who had never been to your website? Um, you know, this is an opportunity to, to uh, uh, educate that person about what your website is about and uh, point them to the most important stuff. So you know, what's the first thing that a person who's never been to your website before should read? Um, you know, where, where, where is your very best stuff? Um, you know, how, how can they get the most out of your content? Like, well, do, are there any tricks or tips that you can give them to uh, navigate your content better? So this is a really, again, like rough mock-up of something that you could do. Dot first, using this code here, dot first visit, right? Um, show this welcome block. Um, like I just said, you know, wh wh an explainer about what your website is, maybe a link to the 20 best posts that you wrote last year. Uh, and then that would disappear after the person comes back the next time. Um, but uh, at least you've had an opportunity to sort of introduce them to your content, to your site. So returning visitors, right? Um, right now we treat all, basically everybody the same. We show them the same content, um, but I don't think that's the best that we can do. Um, so, you know, how can you help re returning visitors find their way in the stream of content that you've published? Some of it's new to them, some of it's old, um, you know, that some of the things might be updated. Um, they may have missed something that was really important uh, because they hadn't visited your website in a couple of days. You know, how can we help them to make sure that they um, keep up to date? Um, and down there, the last thing, you know, how can we optimize for importance rather than newness? This is like I think the, the 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 tragedy of our of our industry is that 10, 15 years ago when blogging became really popular. Here I'm going to start crying again. Um, you know we we all basically standardized on um, new goes at the top at the front of the page. Uh, it pushes older stuff down, and that's the end of the discussion that we had. And uh, now we're here we are in 2013, and WordPress, Drupal, you know every major publishing platform that we use uh, today um, basically defaults to this sort of reverse chronological blog format, um, which I don't really think is is a great experience for people <clears throat> a lot of the time. So here's some things that we can do for for uh, returning readers that will help them sort of anchor their experience. Uh, new flags. Um, this is again these are things that um, Aware does by by uh, out of the box. So here's an example from uh, Pando Daily. Just inserts a little, uh, actually just uh, sets uh, new as a class on a on any arbitrary tag that you ask it to do. So it'll look for a, a date, uh, post date, uh, compare it to the time the user last visited. If the, if if they visited more recently than that, that post is new to them, right? Um, so it could be days old, but it's new to them. They haven't seen it yet. And then you know you style it with a CSS a pseudo class, um, so that's how that works. Post aware, right? That's uh, the, every post is going to be evaluated. <coughs> um, relative bookmarks is another uh, really cool technique. Um, this is uh, an example from Milkshake, which is an image sharing site, really fast-paced image sharing site. Like they're posting stuff, you know, dozens of times every hour. Um, whenever you visit, they insert this little relative bookmark. You started reading here uh, five minutes ago. Uh, if you visit 10 minutes later, you're, you're going to see another little relative bookmark that says, you know, you visited here uh, 10 minutes ago. And that way you know what you've seen and what you haven't seen. You can stop scrolling backwards in the, in the history when you see that little bookmark. Uh, or you can conversely see like how obsessed you are with Milkshake because it's like in between every single image. And like you're spending too much time loading Milkshake. Um, so Aware does that too. Uh, we named it after Milkshake. So you run that command and it'll just insert a little uh, little thing in between uh, the two posts uh, indicating you know above this link new below is old to you to, to that reader it's storing all of that information in local storage and in cookies um, like I said it doesn't translate across browsers but uh, it works works for for the most part um, okay so you know returning visitors uh, serving returning visitors differently is a great but there are a bunch of different types of returning visitors that we should consider um, you know there's readers who visit your site six times a day um, like obsessive news people they're reloading they've got it open in a tab all day long right like those are great great users but we also have people who read your site once every, once every couple of days 
Uh, maybe they read it in the evening on the tablet uh, after a long day work, or um, they read it on the train. Um, so how does it make sense that we're serving the same exact content in the same format to, to both of those people, right? Like we want both of these types of users. We want them to have a good experience, but um, you know, I, I really feel, um, you know, uh, em uh, em I empathize with the people who, who, who don't have time to visit websites all day long. You know, I, I wish I could, but I'm too busy. And I, I, I have a kid, so I don't get to run home and, um, you know, read up every day. So, you know, I, 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 I start up on Friday afternoon to, to read my week's worth of blogs. And, you know, sometimes that's 100, you know, 200, 300 posts that I have to go backwards through in reverse, er, in reverse chronological order, seeing the content, on, you know, in the, in the opposite order of which th that the uh, editor intended it to be presented. Um, and you know maybe I'm lazy uh, and don't go back more than a than a page. Uh, the stats on on our website, the XOXCO company blog, um, we get, we get two percent of the traffic on our second page of posts uh, compared to the first page, right? Two percent. <clears throat> Ninety-eight percent of the people don't ever don't ever click through. So. Um, Here's another a class that we add, a uh, first visit of the day, right? So um, I'm a regular visitor. I've been to your website before, but this is the first time I've come today. Um, can we use this to pull out the most important posts and highlight them in some way? Uh, can we um, reflow the page so that I see um, you know, only the day's top stories instead of just everything or just the most recent thing? Um, you know, we're just talking about sorting things in a different way or uh, highlighting uh, different types of posts based on these classes. Nothing super, super complicated. I don't think it's a really good idea to completely redesign your website every single time a person visits it. But, you know, how can, can we um, use that hero image slot or, uh, uh, you know, resort our carousels to, to emphasize something that's more important to that user or more important based on some internal mechanism, editorial or, you know, some in metrics that we're using um, to make sure that somebody who comes every once in a while gets, uh, gets the good stuff, not just the most recent stuff, which might be crappy. Uh, so another thing that we uh, consider is time of day, right? So I, this is an idea, you know, I play this game called Animal Crossing on my um, Nintendo, which is a totally nerdy, like, game for little girls. Um, but one of the really cool things in Animal Crossing is that uh, it's different depending on what time of day you play the game. Um, it's real time. Um, it's, like, sunny when it's sunny out, and it's dark when it's dark out, and, like, the stores in your, in your damn town are closed at midnight, which is really, really annoying. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing to see software doing is, uh, you know, t I, I'm, I'm eating dinner and playing the game and the characters in the game are playing, are eating dinner also. Um, so, you know, f factoring in time of day to the way we serve our news, um, could have a lot of interesting impact, right? Like it's breakfast time. Um, you know, people are reading your site. Like is, how is that different than people who are reading your site at lunch or at midnight? Um, you know. I don't have a great, um, you know, solid use case for this, but I think that there's something there. I think that there's something interesting, um, and and um, you know, s something to explore and uh, consider when you're when you're building out your next website. So what we're talking about here is basically uh, called merchandising, um, and I feel like that's a term like you know. S search engine optimization um, that like has a sort of gross feeling about it because it seems like business and it's not very designy and uh, um, you know it's like ugh, somebody somebody in like the marketing department should think about merchandising um, but what it is is this is the definition from uh, from Wikipedia you know in a retail situation that basically means you know designing the window uh, that 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 shows off the the, the products you're selling it means um, picking what goes on the end cap at the at the grocery store so that people see that you know like the new Whataburger brand uh, ketchup is available right anybody seen that I'm totally getting it um, I'm like whoa Whataburger brand French fry chips it's amazing. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, it's a, I, I highlighted this thing, Sim, it, it's, it's the goal to stimulate interest and entice customers. Um, so I thought that that was such a great way of, uh, of doing it. I thought it, it looked just like this, you know, um, this poster, um, keep calm and carry on poster, simulate interest and entice customers. That's what we're supposed to do as designers and people who are conveying, you know, publishing content. Um, we want to, you know, m b draw our readers in and entice them into, to reading more and, and potentially to um, subscribing or, um, you know, 
becoming an ongoing reader. So um, mer merchandising is not a bad thing. This is actually something that we really, really need to get better at. Um, so, you know, hopefully t this weekend you've been convinced, if, if you hadn't already been, that you're going to build a responsive website. Maybe you'll try some of these reader aware techniques next time. Um, I, I definitely encourage you to try out that aware JS uh, uh, module that we created. And that's great for, 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 for helping people that come to your website, right? <clears throat> but there's a whole lot of people who don't come to your website, uh, a lot more people that don't come to your website than, than do. So this is sort of the pivot point to the next half of my talk, <clears throat> your back catalog. Um, so uh, where do old posts go when they die? Like I was just saying, um, this is an awesome animated GIF that my designer made. Um, you know, the traditional uh, uh, format of web publishing and, and the, the format used by uh, most sites, uh, small and large, uh, is that the newest stuff goes at the top, it pushes the older stuff down, and that older stuff goes somewhere. Um, and, you know, we assume that it's going to be found by our search engines or by the people who really, really care about it. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at the stats and you keep up on these things, you know, search engine traffic and referral traffic is dropping because being, being replaced by social traffic. So that sort of long tail for old content is not really a safe thing to bet on anymore. Um, the, the emphasis continues to be on newer, newer, newer stuff. But that doesn't mean that the old stuff is bad. Uh, in, uh, uh, quite the contrary, I would say. Um, and we create things at an amazing pace, right? Like everybody's heard this kind of thing, but um, the tech writers at Pando Daily, the people that we work with, write 10,000 words a day. Um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of words. Um, so every two weeks they write a novel's worth of text. Um, I think 150,000 words, right? Um, that's a lot of text. And I'm not saying that every post on Pando Daily is like worth putting into a novel, but just the sheer amount of work that is going into creating these posts on Pando Daily uh, is something to, you know, stop and consider. Um, and the people who write those posts and the editors, they don't think like, oh, well, here's a crappy post, Pfft, you know, I'll put it out there for nobody. They want each one of those posts has the potential for, you know, viral success or growth or, you know, getting a million hits or whatever. Like, that's the point of putting it on the internet in the first place. So every year they write 25 books worth of text. That's just an insane amount of text that's piling up in their database. Um, but, you know, when we built their redesign, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll fall on the sword for this, like, nobody, we didn't and not, neither did they ask about, you know, what their archive design was going to look like. Uh, we didn't cons we considered the front page. We talked about the story page. We talked about you know their video homepage and what and 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 their social channels. But we didn't ever once talk about what was going to happen on page two of their archive. And so it just looks like the front page. Um, here's a here's my favorite example: boingboing.net, right? Like famous, super famous, top number one blog, whatever. Six thousand pages of archives. Uh, also, 6,000 pages of archives only accessible via infinite scrolling. So, um, crazy, right? Like, you, you can't get to, you know, page two without scrolling to the bottom. 6,000 pages later, you're old. Um, Gawker has 4,000 pages of archives, right? They've been around since 2005, 2006. 4,000 pages. I'm not talking about 4,000 posts. There's 4,000 pages of posts that are available on Gawker's website. Um, again, same, same page. So here's Boing Boing page one, here's Boing Boing page two, exactly the same design. Here's Boing Boing page 5869, right? Like same design, uh, no context clues to like the fact that this is old content, that some of this was really, really great when it came out, how important the story was, you know, what happened on this story. They know it's in there. They tag stuff, um, but um, they don't, do a great job of, uh, of, of, sh of guiding people through that content. And they have a list of those ca categories at the top, but those categories just link you to filtered versions of this. So you still have thousands of pages of content to go through, sort of unfiltered and with no guidance. I just think this is just a, a tragedy. Um, I love Boing Boing. You know, I, I, I think that they can do a lot better. So here's the Mount Everest. It's 5.5 miles high. If you printed out the Boing Boing archives end to end, it would be taller than Mount Everest. Like, that's crazy, right? That's just an enormous amount of content to be streamed in this giant pile, unfiltered. Not to scale. When I first, I like tweeted a link to, uh, a screenshot of that and somebody was like, that's not 
how it would look. Like, really? <laughs> it was hard you know, to compare a website to a mountain. <clears throat> so here we go. So you know, I think we just do a really crap job of this. Um, like I said, you know, I've, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. Like I just started thinking about what I should be doing on my second page of archives or my third page of archives. Um, I looked all over the internet for you know um, WordPress plugins that were focused on making your archives better. There's nothing, right? Like the, the themes that have emphasize, emphasize you know your best content or give you tools to to pull those things out. Nothing. Uh, you know, plugins that help you to curate the content within WordPress. Like, where is the tool inside WordPress that says, hey, what was great this week? Right? It doesn't exist. It just never got built into the software. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it got me thinking, you know, it's not like publishing is new. Um, people have been publishing stuff for, for a really long time. And uh, can we learn from some of the things that uh, traditional publishers have done? And you know, really quickly, you realize that a traditional publisher doesn't just put something into the world and then sort of walk away from it and let it do what it will or, or won't do. Um, you know, they, they, not for everything, I, I, to, to be clear, but um, if a book is going to, uh, they think that it's, it's got legs, they're going to put marketing money be behind that book. They're going to send the author out on a book tour. If that book does well, it might come out as a hardback, then as a paperback. It might come out as an ebook. It might come out as an audiobook. Uh, you know, it might be reissued years later or have a second printing. Um, you know, nonfiction books get reprinted and reissued years and years and years um, on after their first publication. They're not rewriting the entire, uh, entire content. They're just repackaging it and reissuing it to a different audience. Um, so I think that we need to do, start doing that as digital publishers, right? Um, the, the things that we create can't just live as a blog post in one, you know, one time. Um, they can they can have a, a, an ongoing lifetime, um, and importantly, they can reach different audiences through this process. Um, so, you know, here's a couple things that we, we thought about, right? Curate your archives at a minimum, right? Like go back and look at your archives and see what you've got, um, and uh, pick out some of the best stuff. Um, Create a place on your homepage that you can republish older material back onto the homepage so that those new users, new, new users will see older stuff. My dad is now trying to FaceTime me. Excuse me. I, I was like, on the way here, I'm like, I bet you my dad will FaceTime me. <clears throat> it's like time for his Wi-Fi router to, to shit out every day. He's like, why does the Wi-Fi router crap out at 5 p.m. every day? I don't know, dad. <clears throat> You got a question about curating your archives, Dad? I can help you. Um, so yeah, republish things on your home. Oh, come on. This is going to happen for the rest of the talk. Um, can I turn my Wi-Fi off? Hold on. Sorry. Good thing it's the last talk. Um, so, and then repackage things into new formats for new audiences. So we're working, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but we're working with a customer uh, with our tool packager to create an ebook uh, version of their website. And one of the interesting things that they told us uh, as they were putting this thing together was, you know, they're on their website, they have this one, this certain type of audience. They're sort of the news junkie type people. They're coming every day um, and it's very political stuff. So the, um, the audience for advertising is very limited and sort of narrow, right? Like, advertisers don't want to get near political stuff but when they shift the format into an ebook they're collecting this just a category of content that they published over the last couple of months into an ebook format all of a sudden the audience for that content is this leisure time premium audience right people who spent 15 bucks on an ebook and are now reading it on their Kindle on their couch at home and taking the time to absorb that content so even though it's still political material they feel like they can get a sponsor for that ebook that's more of a lifestyle brand or a bigger, you know, more premium brand because of the context uh, uh, of those readers is to so totally different than what it was on the internet. So I think that's really interesting. So, you know, I think that this is really something that anybody can do, right? So, like, here's, a, here's some ways that you can um, curate your archives to, um, and, and, you know, conceive of these repackaged uh, things, right? Best of blank. Right, whatever your your vertical topic is, you know the year in blank, buyer's guide to blank, blank in a nutshell. Right, like if you have been publishing for you know years or even just months, like you probably have one of these 
on your site already, just in a bunch of disparate posts. Can you put those things together into one place for your old, new, and you know, um, you know, uh, readers? And would people maybe buy that from you? Um, um, I think that they would. Um, so. You know, this is a, a, a quoting myself here from my blog. We want to help digital publishers continue the long tradition of creating distinct artifacts of their time to take the important things out of the stream and put them in context, their proper place in space-time, right? So the, the stream of content that you're putting online is always moving, always moving, always moving, and that tends to lessen the value of the content, lessen the impact that it has. Um, but if we can take it out of that stream and sort of fix it there, then it becomes um, something of more value. <clears throat> So um, one of the scenarios that we talk about uh, with our clients is, is creating the we a weekly edition of their website. Um, the Atlantic Monthly just did this. They just announced uh, that they've uh, created a weekly edition um, iPad application. Um, but basically, the idea here is uh, actually let me let me say mention another one. The All uh, has a thing called the Weekend Companion, an, also an iPad app. The idea here is, you know, these guys publish tons and tons of material. Uh, the Atlantic Monthly publishes, you know, five or six different websites and a print magazine. What they're doing with these weekly edition things is taking five or six articles, putting them into a nice format, and selling that for like two bucks. So it's not for the people who read their website every day, or maybe it is, but it's for the people who want to have, you know, a sort of more relaxed um, experience just sitting down and reading that content. Um, in, an, in an environment that's not going to have blinking ads, uh, it's not going to be like ticking, ticking away their, their work hours, um, they're just going to sit and read. Um, another one that we're really excited about, especially for new sites, is the idea of a zero day ebook. This is actually an idea um, uh, or a term coined by um, the guy Matt Honan from Wired, who you may remember was the guy who got his entire identity um, hacked by people who got into his Apple account and his, his iPad got wiped and stuff. Terrible story, but um, so the zero day ebook is the idea like, okay, let's say you're Matt Honan, you just got hacked, you have this big story. It's a big breaking story and lots of new traffic is coming into your, to your Gawker blog, or I'm sorry, your Wired blog. Um, go, ba go back into your archives and find all of the material about hacking. Um, boil it up into one uh, new ebook and make that ebook available on the day that this story is breaking. Uh, and you know, link it at the top of that story of that breaking news story, right? Again, this kind of stuff used to be hard, um, but now there are tools that are out there, including Packager, um, that that allow you to do this kind of stuff and get uh, something like an ebook to market really, really quick. So, what does that do, right? Like, you have a bunch of people coming into your website uh, based on a, a breaking news story or like a tweet that went viral. They may ne they may never have come to your website in the first place, or they may never come back. But this gives you the opportunity to tr to capture them as a you know a longer term um, reader of your site, right? They're going to click to download that ebook. Maybe it's free. Maybe you get a couple bucks. But that book will then be in their iBooks library or on their Kindle for the rest of the existence of that device, right? And so they're going to find it at, when they get on a plane six months from now and read it. Um, or um, you know, like I said, they might just need to take the time to to, to read that uh, you know when they're back home from work. Um, they might subscribe to your email, right? Uh, email, email newsletter when otherwise they wouldn't. Um, so, you know, an incredibly valuable uh, uh, technique to turn these passing visitors into long, longer term subscribers, um, which is, I think, really what we all need to start doing. Um, the advertising is not gonna is not gonna pay for everything for for much longer. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, these kind of use cases for repackaging content at our Packager documentation site, um, which is right there. <clears throat> and you can just go to our website, uh, which will be linked in a couple seconds again, um, to, to see that stuff. Um, we're really, we're, um, yeah, really interested in this kind of thing. Um, here's a couple examples uh, of people doing more interesting stuff with their archives uh, than you know just having a second page uh, that looks the same. So Smashing Magazine, um, you know, great web development resource. They have a, a library of eBooks, right? That they take their most popular posts, they uh, weave them together into a nice little eBook, and then you can download it um, or subscribe to access to their to their eBook library. And um, 
you know, hugely valuable content, um, and they pick and choose a couple of different posts and put it together into a single ebook, and it becomes much more substantial. Um, like, I would encourage you guys to try it. Like, it's kind of amazing to take three or four blog posts, which look like I, we have this conversation with our clients all the time. Like, ugh, how it's just stuff I put on my blog. Like, how can it possibly stand up as an ebook? First of all, an ebook is just a zip file fold, filled with HTML5 documents, or not even um, XHTML documents. Um, so don't get too upset about what the, the, the format, right? Uh, second of all, like uh, three 500 word blog posts turns into like a 30 page ebook. So it seems sub more substantial. Um, and you know, I think it, it actually is because you're adding curation to the process, to, to the content. Okay, technologyreview.com, MIT's uh, Technology Review Magazine. They have a really cool like section at towards the bottom of their page where they surface content from five, you know, five, ten, fifteen years ago. They're, they're, they they've got a long history of publishing. So when I took this screenshot, um, I thought this was really funny. Like three years ago, can Twitter make money? It's like we're still asking that question, and like to see that we have been asking that question for many years, like puts that question into into context that you know you wouldn't have otherwise. So I think that's really awesome. Print your next PC, right? Eleven years ago, they were asking about three D printing. Um, Scott Scott Barracoon, however you pronounce that dude's name, uh, he has a really awesome page on his site. Like when you click to see his archives, you actually get this post. It's just a post, but um, uh, where he's highlighted the topics that he's really interested in and picked, um, you know, half a dozen or a dozen posts in each one of those topics so that instead of just getting the unfiltered archive, you, he says, like, here's the stuff you really need to know. Um, and meanwhile, um, <clears throat> he also collected, um, I think, 40 of his most popular, 30 of his most popular posts in 2011, and he put them into an ebook. He sells that for nine bucks on Amazon. When, uh, when I took this screenshot, that was, uh, that was doing really well. Like, you know, substantial sales of this book. Um, all of the material was still available online for free. Um, but, you know, he was selling thousands of copies of this book. So here's our cool example. Um, we started this uh, newsletter, XOX Code Dispatch, um, for uh, people who like to hear about what we're doing. And you know, everybody tells you to start an email uh, newsletter. Um, so we put a lot of effort into these things, like we release um, uh, limited edition software via the newsletter and like send out essays before we publish them on our blog. We put a lot of effort into it so we didn't want it to just like disappear after, you know, our first, our first email went to 65 people. Like that's not enough for the two weeks that I spent, you know, crafting this, this newsletter. So we, um, oh, here's the newsletter, right? As it originally appears as a responsive HTML email. Um, so we also publish each issue as an ebook and put it on Amazon. Um, so it takes like 24 hours to submit an ebook and have it live on Amazon. Um, you can only, you can, it, the minimum price is 99 cents. We would love to do, to do it for free, but uh, we can't. Um, but yeah, same content, different format. You know, now anybody, if we ever want to say, you know, hey, go read that essay from our first ever um, email newsletter, it's available here in a really nice format. It's like on a Kindle. People who had Kindles never had the chance to receive our email newsletter in the first place. So like totally new audience for this stuff. And, you know, maybe like we'll make a couple bucks. Um, uh, actually, we'd make like, 17 cents per, per download on these, but whatever. And ironically, like Amazon's like free preview of the ebook shows the first page, which has a link to the ebook for free. Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> Go to it, people. Go get your free ebooks. Um, and then like we were like, that's cool. Amazon's awesome, but like let's also do an iPad app. So um, we we released the iPad version of it, so all of the back issues of our newsletter are now available as like iPad magazines. And like new issues get pushed to anybody who who downloads our newsstand app, uh, and like we this newsstand app came out last Friday. I didn't tell anybody, and like 500 people downloaded it. Now, not a huge number of people, but like that doubled the amount of people who are um, getting access to to Dispatch. Uh, we did no pr promotion, so there's like some inherent interest in the Apple iTunes Store for newsstand applications, um, and you know like now we have these people who have our app. <clears throat> on their home screen, and um, whenever we publish something, they'll get a push notification, right? These people just pass through otherwise. So, really cool. Um, all of that stuff, not to 
well, I'll fuck it, to my own horn, um, is, is made possible by Package or our tool. Um, so yeah, really awesome. Um, so if you guys want to hear more about this stuff, go subscribe to Dispatch. We send it out every once, every couple of weeks, uh, probably bi-monthly uh, or, or thereabouts. Um, try to be really super high value, like 80% open rate. Yes. Um, so um, please, by all means, join up if, you, if you'd like or download the app. Uh, and then the slides for this talk and a video of a previous version are at that link there, xoxgo.com slash rad talk. Uh, that's me and my company on Twitter. And that's that. <clears throat> so, any questions? No, everybody just want to go home. Go ahead. Caching. So, yeah. Sure. So the yeah, and I mean that's why I said it used to be. Sorry, the question was you know if if you're customizing the content per user, you know you kind of lose the um, power of caching. Um, the what reader aware uh, JS and intention JS do um, is do that all on the client side. So instead of processing and creating different markup on your server and sending different markup to each one, you send the same markup to every single user and then customize it uh, in the browser using you know, the similar uh, techniques to responsive design, right? So um, basically um, reflowing the content based on a, st uh, on a class um, that you treat like a, a media query. Um, Intention JS does, like, like I said, a lot more complicated stuff. It can actually move things around in your DOM. So, like your mobile menu or whatever, like instead of repeating the markup in different places, it can actually move that menu into a different space. So it can like come out as a slide out or whatever you want to do on a phone. Um, but yeah, like I said, limited to that one device that the person is on, but all done on the on the client side. So um, no, uh, one of the things that we like to talk about is it doesn't require user registration at all. Right, like, wh why why do you have to register just to see what's new, um, or just to get this sort of basic service? Sure, yeah, the question was, can you use this for e-commerce you know, uh, products? Uh, yeah, I mean, th th Aware is set up to do uh, date-based stuff primarily. Um, so like, is it new or not? Um, but uh, Intention.js, like I said, can, you can set up any type of context that you want. So you're on your own to define those, those analytics, right? So Aware does things like it'll, ca it'll capture how long it has been since the, visit, the user visited. Um, and, and, and provide that to you, um, or um, you know whether or not they're a first-time visitor, that kind of thing. Um, but you can set up any other kind of metrics that you'd want to to track that. Um, uh, but yeah, and and, and what one, one of the things that both of these libraries does also is provide that information to you as JavaScript. So one, you don't you don't necessarily have all of the content you want. Um, one of the scenarios that we worked on was uh, you know let's show only stuff that the, the user hadn't seen in the top carousel. Um, so we serve like 10 posts to fill that carousel. Initially, if like nine of them are already read, we need more, but um, we just use JavaScript to go and pull for more, uh, pull our content API for more. Um, but you know, we don't have to do that unless we, um, we know that we need more content. Uh, any other questions? Good. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, thank you for asking that because it gives me an excuse to show you Packager. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I, I think that the, it is a big, I got to wrap up. Okay. It is a really big task. Um, I think that the, the trick is to start doing it now 
and um, don't think about it as necessarily a comprehensive like overhaul of your archives. But if b what is doable for Boing Boing to do is to like bundle up a book of like robots and put that at the top of their archive, or like to start a weekly edition and you know move forward. Because what happens with when you're building those weekly editions, when you're curating on the ground, um, you know you're starting to build this library of of packaged material that you that you have. Um, so like we like with uh, dispatch, you know, we started it as an email, but each issue of that email was still there and ready to be republished in these different formats. Um, and that's one of the things that Packager does. I'll just show you one. Oh, oh, duh. Here it is. Wow, look at that bundle of content. Woo! Publish, and then it's publishable as an ebook, as a uh, iOS content bundle, as an HTML5 application, or as an email. So all of these things you curate it once bundle it up real nice and publish it into all of those different formats. So what we'd like to see is, you know, these kind of curation tools built into the content management systems and or curation tools that are standalone um, like Packager that allow people to take that time to just do the ongoing curation instead of having to go back and like curate 15 years of, of, uh, of material. Cool. I think I'm out of time. I'll be around for a couple minutes if anybody else has any questions or if you'd like to try Packager. And one last thing, I'm looking to hire a Drupal person for a contract gig in the next couple months. So if you, uh, if you uh, want to do some Drupal stuff, uh, build some content APIs, come talk to me. Thanks. <laughs>